what is your favorite? Um, I haven't really been paying attention to the rocks. <laughs> um, let me think. So should we collect this one? Yes. Okay. I guess I like this one because I finally decided to collect one. <laughs> we'll pull zoom there. This is my rock. Yeah, look at that. That's pretty. It's like a weird chunk of crust or something. Yeah. Oh, I think right crust, it's not quite the right color, but it definitely stands out. We'll have to bring it up and see what it is. But also, it's kind of fairly angular, so I have potentially a good feeling about this for amber but yeah, also need, who knows you got the images you need of it yep all right we're good back here if you want to stow it okay i'm going uh, we got the large bio boxes on the starboard side are both open it's a little rock for a large box right all the little ones are full there's one little one uh, open the starboard box there for us. Yeah, in the starboard Copy box. Copy that. The second one from the aft. Second one from the aft, right? What's that sample number, data? 097. 097, thank you. Thanks, Earl. Second one from the aft. Okay, box. close it. So a viewer sent in something about a Ocalantis, a rare octopus colony in Australia where the octopus all kind of uh, aggregate together. Right. And it's gonna do a little have a self-sustaining community. Very around. cool. Future of cephalopod evolution. Thanks for the rock. Our pleasure. Something's supposed to stick in there. <laughs> we need to work nope. on that. Why did you take it off? Take the magnet off. That seemed to be fairly effective. Uh, it was really difficult to get it on and off the magnet, and it was kind of a funky handle. So, okay. and also, um, it wasn't in such a place where we could snip and slurp. Ah. So, well, is that porch is all the way in. It's uh, it's meant to kind of lodge itself in there. And a snip and slurp. Got it. That makes sense. But the uh, I think the the hose needs to be a little bit longer there. Too. Yeah, right. 
the bungee arrangement there to hold the loop up, kind of been playing with that to get it where there's enough slack where it sits in the holster. But um, <coughs> we have a grand plan to do a 3D print with a magnet array inside the holster, so when it goes in, it kind of clicks in like your uh, nice. phone mount does. But I haven't, haven't got there yet. Video going off Weather bomb for a moment. Project. You ready for another move? Yeah. Uh, sure. You want to do a quick zoom on the sponge or no? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I don't even... My eyes didn't even process that was a sponge. Bridge, nav. Can we have another move? Two zero meters, one zero zero, please. Thank you. Ooh, sun's starting to come up. Yep. I'm going to get my ducks in a row here to move. Video back on column. So what was your uh, bearing on it? One zero zero. One zero zero, Roger. Steaming off to the end of the sunset, sunrise. Sticking its tongue out. Mm -mm. So we have a question from Joe in Scotland. How old are the corals that we're looking at? Hundreds to thousands of years, as a general rule. And obviously we're seeing some babies that are younger too, but um, these corals are easily many hundreds, if not several thousand years old. Would individual polyps be that old or is there a lot of turnover? That's an excellent question. Um, and I'm not entirely sure. So we, bait, we age these things by their skeletons. And so there would be turnover in the polyps, probably, um, on the, on an individual skeleton. Come up, five. Okay. Let's check out that star. <laughs> check out that star. If you want. Who's that star? Oh, star. oh the star. Range. Go ahead, there. Starfish. That's a fun welcome sight. Something a little bit different after a sea of brittle stars. Go uh, full zoom on the star there. See some texture. Oh, so pretty. All right. So I think this is a type of going asteroid sea star. See it's two feet reaching out, feeling around it. Echinoderms are pretty cool. They have a water vascular system that they uh, move around by changing the water pressure in their feet. Uh, uh, and they can also suction onto things. It's a pretty nifty form of lo locomotion. All right, science is happy. Okay, I can go in, thanks. We have some uphill in our immediate future here. A viewer said that the starfish looks like a sugar cookie. So next Christmas, Chris, are you going to try to make sugar cookie starfish? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have Lynette decorate them. Yeah, good idea. Why do you have to wait? Is that Christmas? a cookie star, or was it a different one? There's one called the cookie star. Oh. Right? Yeah, there 100% is a cookie star, but I don't remember what it looks like. Yeah. All I know is we got to I see the cookies you decorated yesterday, and they were superb. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait a Only minute, took you like decorated cookies? Not here. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying I missed those. Uh, <laughs> for Christmas on Palmyra. 
We all decorated cookies. The nets were substantially better than mine. <laughs> Yours were unique. Special. <laughs> you call them special? <laughs> So we're definitely seeing moving out of the super high density band of corals here as we get up um, a little bit higher on this feature. Still got some very pretty big corals, but certainly um, well that, that does look very similar to a cookie star. Okay. That's so probably a close relative. Couple of Victorgias here, which have been seen a few of them, but in lower abundance than the hemicoralliums that are dominating this this feature. You want to keep it moving, Dan? Sure. Bridge now. Can we have another two zero meters, one zero zero, please? Thank you. Looks like we're leveling out a bit. Yeah. Ooh, question for Dan. Did the remodel of Hercules change its weight? Yeah, it got a little heavier. We uh, added a bit of uh, buoyancy to it, more syntactic foam. And then, of course, we had to have more ballast to compensate for the extra buoyancy, but that allows us to do things like uh, put 300 pounds of laser bot on the <laughs> Laser dive bot, sorry. Next dive, we get to dive back out with laser dive bot. Yeah, so we have to take a little bit of lead off of Hercules. So. Egg bamboo whip drifting off to the right. Got another metallogorgia here with a Comachula crinoid sitting on top of it. You have a dead stock of something? Yep. Yeah, that sponge picked a bad rock. Yep, looks like that rock got knocked over. Yeah, so we're looking at a pretty tight turnaround for our next dive. Uh, we're going to recover this dive in a few hours and then steam for about eight hours. No one wants to do south of here and then put right back in the water uh, this evening, ship time. Um, with uh, the Raman spectrometer um, back on board to do a, a dive actually in the same depth range we're in right now in the 14 to 1200 range on, but on the very top center of uh, Aguio, about 50 miles, 60 miles south of here for a, a shorter overnight dive to do some additional engineering testing and explore the probably the more sedimented areas of um, the center of the feet of one of these geos. I got to watch them firing up uh, the laser on one of our sample rocks. It was so interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed that. That, could, that would have been kind of cool. They were doing that in the lab, weren't they? Yeah, I got to put on the special safety glasses and everything. And then they showed me the computer screens and like how they analyze it. It was really interesting. I'm looking forward to getting some time to see what kind of readings we get off different types of corals. 
and yes. see if, any, yes. if there's any distinction we can see across the um, different biology species with it. They have a fluorescence um, setting that I'm optimistic will work well on corals. Ooh. What will that allow you to identify with the... That's an excellent question. Um, with one band, uh, one wavelength, probably not much, um, but a uh, kind of continuous interest of mine is figuring out ways to identify corals in an automated fashion. Um, and I think five. like RGB cameras using machine learning is really only getting us so far. Um, and I'm curious if some forms of fluorescence imaging and hyperspectral imaging will allow us to get automated classifications of corals to the genus and species level more effectively at scale. And so being able to do exactly what we're doing here with an AUV, um, but based purely on spectral signatures as opposed to images in the classic sense uh, would allow us to cover a whole lot area quicker. Push in there. So the white coral here is an analopsamia um, with a uh, squat lobster associate. And then the pinkest coral in the foreground here is a hemicrallium. And then the primoid just out of frame to the left, I believe, is a cliptrophora which is a type of primnoid. And then we've got a little cup coral in the background, too. Another question for the ROV team. How come the ROV components do not get rusted after being in the salt water for so long? They're uh, mostly aluminum and titanium is a non-ferrous metal. Basically, it doesn't, it's metal that doesn't rust. There's also a lot of uh, uh, Delrin is a common name, but ultra-high molecular weight plastic. Well, it's super dense. It doesn't, uh, it's not affected by the depth of the cold. Awesome, thank you. Okay, you can go right to this. And you've also got a bunch of uh, zinc sacrificial anodes on there to help prevent corrosion, right? Yeah, there are um, well over two dozen anodes on the new frame. And they are, yeah, they are indeed zincs. So same out anode you would find on your outboard motor or your aluminum boat. Yeah, and so those those help dump um, extra charge on the vehicle into the water. To, and you corrode the zinc anodes as opposed to corroding the vehicle frame. It's pretty common on most metal ships. We'll have end vehicles. We'll have that. They're also uh, all over the manipulators. There's uh, discrete anodes on the lights and some of the cameras. This is a really tall bamboo whip we're looking at here. It's approaching as tall as the vehicle. It's got all its polyps retracted. Where do we find zinc at? Is it mined? Is it made in a lab? It's mine. Yeah. It's in drawer three in the ROB shop. <laughs> <laughs> Now this dive has really been, it's hemicrallium, so just dominating this dive. I think, I think I said this earlier, but this is definitely the, the most hemicralliums I've ever seen um, in terms of density and consistency of them being the dominant coral over this large an area. Another basket star on the one on the right. 
looks like a big fleshy anemone on this one on the left. Those uh, spotters seem to prefer that particular coral. Or? Yeah, so that's the the white one is an in Alps um, and the, you know we believe a lot of these um, associates are have a higher degree of aff affiliation with one specific taxa of corals. So we have a very sweet comment online that I want to read to y'all guys. And it says, I love y'all's team dynamic. Everybody I've ever worked with on or near the water has always been salty people. Y'all guys seem like genuinely nice and interesting people, and it's very refreshing. Keep up the amazing work. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and this is this big, broad one here is a primnoid. Probably Clyptophora. Yeah, this is also home to some of the biggest corals we've seen in this entire expedition. Yeah, we, we had the one dive where we had all the super tall Aritagorgias, um, but in terms of overall mass, yeah, I agree. A lot of basket stars, which makes me happy. Sort of thing. <coughs> that one's so big, the branches have broken off. Probably, yeah. Or all the dead branches laying around there. Yeah. Again, we don't know much about the mortality of these things, so. But yeah, that that seems like a very reasonable assumption. Fun question to ponder on. So since we're talking about all the corals having associates, what would be a human associate? And Lice. I answered, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I hope I have no human associates in my hair. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of things you really don't want to know about, frankly, <laughs> that live on you. There's like the bugs in your eyelashes. Yeah, I was just thinking <laughs> yeah. about those, the mites. <laughs> I, I don't want to know about them. Yeah. <laughs> There's the uh, parasites that live in your stomach if you eat a lot of seafood. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Mm -hmm. mm. Most people have parasites in the U.S. So seafood. Our method for eating is weird. Also, if you have pets, we would often associate I'll call maybe your pets your associate. Certainly, if you sit on your couch with your cat or your dog in your lap, and, and uh, an alien biologist would come around and refer to them as your associates. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I just heard um, from Jules that cats can give humans brain parasites. Yep. Toxoplasma. Everyone has toxoplasma. Do we really? Most people. Yeah. I've heard of toxoplasma, but. <laughs> Holy moly. And then if you get into the, the bacterial microbial realm, then you've got hundreds, thousands of species. Yeah, um, yeah. Hundreds or thousands. Yeah. Um, More than 40 million people in the U.S. are infected with toxoplasma. What? So the crinoid, bathopathies. Sure. Pick it up. Uh, happy with 20. Picking up in a little thicket of the paramarsids. Oh, I didn't realize toxoplasma is from a specific single-celled parasite. I thought it was like a general infection term.
So we're just surveying around here. I'm not asking oh. for a lot of zooms right now because we've seen most of these corals and gotten a good look at them or sampled several of them. Um, and so we're kind of just covering ground to get a sense of um, the distribution and abundance of these on a, on a larger spatial scale. So this is this kind of angle of being a meter or so off the seafloor and cruising along uh, is really good for video annotating. I want to treat this basically as a transect up the side of this feature um, and be able to kind of correlate um, the bathymetry, some of the environmental sensors we have running, like temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, um, and help us better understand some of the patchiness, potentially, of why we see these areas where there's very little coral and then get back in these thicker areas. Um, is the kind of type of analysis that we'll do on this on top of kind of the morphological and genetic taxonomy of looking at the samples, doing some um, gene sequencing, and studying them under a microscope to try and place them more accurately in the tree of life than we can do just kind of on the fly here um, looking at the video. Uh, and then other colleagues may work up like the f fidelity of the associates <laughs> and looking at um, how many of these corals have an associate living in them and what the associates are and things like that. There's a whole host of different analysis that can all be done on this type of um, video exploratory video transects that we're doing here with Hercules. And given that this seamount has uh, never been explored and that there was only one dive previously in U.S. waters north of the monument, uh, which was also a Nautilus dive from 2021, I think, um, they were really you know, laying the foundation for all future deep sea um, studies here will be based loosely at least on the work we're doing here on this baseline characterization of just kind of documenting what lives down here and ground truthing the sonar um, data in terms of the rock types, the shape, uh, and the life here on these seamounts. And one of the immediate uses for this data is this area is under consideration for uh, the creation of a national marine sanctuary. Um, and there's actually a public comment period open right now to get people's thoughts, opinions on um, creating a EEZ wide or the entire exclusive economic zone uh, <laughs> around the Pacific Rhode Islands um, as a, a US national marine sanctuary. And I believe the public comment ends June 2nd, so you've still got another day or two uh, if you'd like to express your feelings about it. After the public comment period ends, what's the next step? Um, there's a, a period where Noah looks at all the comments, um, and you know there has to be an internal decision within the federal government about whether they think that it's worthy of pursuing, and then they will start drafting um, actual boundaries, um, actual rules and protections, um, and guidelines, and then there'll be a there'll be a proposed um, yeah set of boundaries and set of actual rules, uh, and then it'll open up for another round of public comment. Um, right now, it's kind of a general. This whole area is uh, are people interested or opposed to having a sanctuary here, and then if. Um, the decision of the administration is that it looks like they should move forward. Uh, they'll draw up a much more detailed plan of what it would actually look like, how the management would work, uh, and then release that back for another round of public comment at some point in the future. And then this all has to go before Congress to get passed, no? It doesn't actually require an act of Congress, no. It's a, it can be done fully in the executive branch. Um, based on the National Marine Sanctuary Act. But it is a, a long um, process with many steps uh, along the way. So is this like years, decades? It varies depending on how, frankly, how much public interest and how much political interest there is in it. Um, it can easily take decades um, or it can be a matter of years. And you've been working on this for a couple of years already, haven't you? I, I wouldn't say working on it. I've been providing a, some scientific 
insights and help to a couple preparing a couple of the draft documents or, or advocacy documents for this and or uh, an expansion of the National Marine Monument that currently exists. Um, but yes, the, where we are now is, has been years in the making already to get, us, to get a formal public comment period open. Um, but certain other areas like um, Hudson Canyon in the Atlantic um, and the ch proposed Chumash um, Heritage Sanctuary off the coast of California have been in the works for years. Um, can we look at the coral just out of frame to the right? Yeah. Waiting for the ship there. This big one. Uh, push it there down. So this is a primnoid, which we've been seeing, frankly, less of than usual for this depth uh, on this dive. This one has a more unusual wave curve action it going does. on. It does. It absolutely does. Um, I think it's still a type of Cliptophora. Um, What's up with the one in the bottom right? Is it just shadowy or is it black? It's out of frame now. Okay. But that one. That, I believe, is some kind of very thin bodied um, bathopathies. But you're right, that does look different. Looks like it, it may just have its, it may have its, just kind of have its t tentacles retracted. All right, we're good, thank you. Okay, you can go wait. What waypoint are we at right now? We have not yet made it to four. We've been aiming at four all, the entire I'm watch. I'm wide on both now. So with the Raman spectrometer coming on in the next dive, do you think that it might shed some light on why different corals are different colors? No. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly won't shed any light on the evolutionary history of why they developed that way. Um, What I'm really interested in is just do we see a variation in what the wavelengths they're interested in? If I, we shoot it at a hemichralium and then shoot it at a primnoid, does it come up different or does it just come up as coral? Gotcha. Um, and the way that works is it'll come up with specific compounds, um, but do we see a different mix of compounds reflecting or fluorescing or inter interacting with the laser that's in a distinguishable way between the different um, taxonomy group taxonomic groups or even if we can just distinguish you know clearly coral from rock um, based on um, the spectra we would get back from the thing. even if we could do this on a, a scale and just have a really reliable ground cover of this is reliably biological versus this is reliably geological would be a useful tool mm. Big swell set, swell set just came yeah. through. The control room's rocking. Good night to all the people watching in Australia. Have a good sleep. So, question for the ROV team: What positional control do, controls does Atalanta have? Uh, Atalanta has uh, auto heading capabilities, so I can set a target heading and it will automatically orient itself towards that target heading. Oh, 
you also have depth control, right? Uh, the depth control on land is mostly just the winch. Yeah, but that's how you control the depth. Right. It's not like on Hercules where uh, you can set a depth and it will automatically hold that depth for you. It's good old-fashioned manual control. We are uh, we are looking at um, Auto Delta and uh, some of the other systems utilize that. Where it, uh, it sets Atlantis depth based on uh, Hercules depth. Put you out of a job. I was just about to ask, what would I do then? And you would have to monitor the Auto Delta to make sure it doesn't go crazy. Same with well, the, uh, sometimes you want Hercules. more, sometimes you want less. <laughs> yeah, I would have to have voice control. Here's my current. I'm feeling <laughs> as, as more people are, are chiming in from Scotland, I'm feeling very left out here in the Pacific. <laughs> Hi, Tina. I Ready for another Scotland. 20. Okay. I can try a 50. Bridge now. If you want, I can go for a 50. Can we move five zero meters, one zero zero, please? Thank you. Can we look at this one, please? Sure. Yeah, we're at the big fans. Go ahead there, zoom in there. getting pulled a bit. You want me to come down? No, we'll come back around. Copy. That should be good for I still okay. get up. I, I think that's away. an umbilopathies. Umbilopathies. Just gonna, uh, I don't know if I, I don't think I went over this patch here. your camera to the right. I swing your heading to the right. Come up a bit. Looking at the Atalanta view, it looks like we're going to come into a nice little patch here at the top of this little hill. Morning. Another question for Dan, what modification would you most like to have on the ROV if the money, if money was no issue? Oh, huh. that's a long list. <laughs> Top three? Top three, um, a pair of, uh, a pair of new manipulators, uh, more cameras and uh, a little bit more horsepower, new thrusters, valve packs. That's a good list. But probably the, uh, you want to stop her up here for a minute and I'll walk around this. Yeah. Bridge now. Can we hold position, please? Thank you. Our, uh, some of the oldest components, oh yeah, and, uh, not to mention all the electronics in the bottle. So the original equipment on Hercules that hasn't been upgraded are the, uh, the thrusters, the valve packs, and uh, the electronics mm -hmm. in the main bottle. So the telemetry system, all the IO, the controls, so we can put more goodies like laser dive bot on the vehicle. Uh, Robert's actively working on um, design to upgrade the power system so we have more power to power devices and a uh, new telemetry system. Basically new 
electronics in the in the main bundle. And then probably on the roadmap is um, some modern yeah. valve packs. So our valve packs currently are kind of similar to your lawn sprinklers, where there's discrete wires for all the valves. A more modern one will have a circuit board in the valve pack that controls all the valves in the valve pack so you don't have to have uh, dozens of discrete wires. Yeah. Come up a bit, please. Copy. Daryl, can you go back to a light on Atlanta? Thank you, that's perfect. It can come right up there. Understood. Great view here of uh, Ooh. this really oh, pretty good. community. We got mainly hemicralliums here. One in Lapsamia, uh, one probably Coralidae, one Aridogorgia, a um, couple basket stars, all kinds of life here. So Nav, just to let you know, we're going to extend the dive um, a few more hours, probably aiming at a two, a 1400 recovery now. It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of expecting that. Sounds good. We like it, thank you. I'm just gonna back off a little bit here for the digital still camera and get an overview of the, the rock for you. So I know you gotta crop out my porch. Did you say 1400 recovery? That's the current plan. Gotcha, thank you. Should be a better overview there for the DSC. Am I too far away now? I'm getting good pictures. Yeah, I'll try and back away a bit to somewhere in there, maybe. So another question for the ROV pilots. Uh, does a Hercules pilot start off as an Atalanta slash Argot pilot and then eventually move up? I actually was wondering the same thing. Uh, yeah, several of uh, several of the Hercules pilots now um, started as uh, Atalanta pilots. Uh, Jess is one. Uh, Gabby's another one. Okay, and then follow-up question. How long does it take for surface moves to propagate down to Atalanta? That's a good question. Uh, it is a little depth dependent. If I had to guess, based on our current depth, it takes ooh, maybe a solid two to three to four seconds for uh, motion in the winch to translate to like solid motion in Atalanta. Awesome, thank y'all. This would have been another uh, fantastic. Uh, we can also just pull the stills out of the video and run it. Oh yeah, maybe I'll do a kind of a over. Is that too far away to? That's probably a little too far away. Yeah, but if you wanna, I would say about there, and if you want to pirouette the rock at this at this distance out. Yeah, can do. So what we're talking about is using uh, a technique called structure for motion video um, for making a three-dimensional reconstruction of this feature. So we'll pan around it with the video, then we'll take uh, frame grabs out of the video and feed it into a computer program that can build a basically a centimeter scale accurate reconstruction of the feature um, based on just the individual still captures uh, pulled out of the video. It's really an absolutely mind-blowing piece of technology. Um, the math under the hood to make it work is just makes my head hurt. Thank but you. it's a super, super powerful tool for uh, uh, allowing us to do uh, some additional spatial work from video alone without having to have a, an additional sensor like a forward-looking multi-beam or a laser line scanner or something like that on the vehicle. Um, 
it is a little bit harder to work with some of these ROV videos because of the way the light comes from. So because the light is coming with the vehicle and the shadow shift, uh, and that can help, that can confuse the algorithm that makes the um, thing. So this is a lot easier to do in shallow water where you have ambient light uh, from the surface um, than working with ROV video where the light and the shadows are shifting continuously depending on the position of the camera. But we've had, I've definitely had some success um, doing it. When we're targeting it, it doesn't work as well in kind of the passive mode of, I just want to reconstruct something after the fact where we didn't do a concerted pirouette kind of pan with an equal uh, distance off the feature. Oh, an excellent question. Uh, we have somebody online wondering if they can make comments uh, about the National Marine Sanctuary, even if they are not a US citizen. I don't know the answer. The way it is set up, um, there isn't a question for you to say your citizenship or anything. So, um, but you do, I think, put your address in. So I'm sure you can make a comment. Um, I don't know if it would be weighted differently or not and the analysis phase. I can come down five now. Copy. Another little Victor Gorgia. Yep. I'll have you all trained up on all the corals by then. We'll have another two weeks. Cup coral down there too. And then I'll go home and forget everything. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to brush up before every cruise. <laughs> oh yeah, Coralie, where's our rope? Uh, what? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I thought I we forgot were going to be practicing our, our line tying skills. Uh, I meant to bring it up. It's right by my door, but I woke up four minutes before I had to be up here. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is just an epic rock. Yeah, Daryl, can we zoom in on the Atlantic cam? It's a really cool view. Before we leave, when we finish this kind of turn, I want to zoom in on one or two of these. All right, just about around it here. Yep. We have another Hercules question, and I don't even know how to paraphrase it, so I'm just going to read it verbatim. Does Hercules have facility to fit specialized non-standard instruments within its structure and control system on a temporary basis? Absolutely. There are such on the vehicle as we speak. I love that. I thought that was like a really intense, hard to answer question. And you're like, yes, 100%. <laughs> I mean, that they, the laser dive bot we're using is exactly that, this, um, this expedition. It's a two parts uh, laser dive bot. Very giant, uh, I think they're lithium battery bottle. That's, I don't know. 300 millimeters around and probably a meter and a half long. 
been the uh, laser dive bot itself, which is, goes uh, so that the battery is mounted horizontally inside the frame. You can uh, see part of it there in Atlantis view at the moment. And the uh, laser dive bot mounts uh, vertically on the on the back of Hercules. We put it on and off there with a crane. That's how heavy it is. All right, Dan, if you don't mind backtracking to the kind of the pinnacle of that point of that rock we were just on. Right There's it. a specific coral. Darryl, can you line up on Atlanta a bit, for Dan? Perfect, thank you. Sorry, up at the top here? No, tongue down towards the bottom a little bit. Oh. That big one coming in center screen low. And We can zoom back in on the Atlanta wow, camera. Wow, so pretty. Yeah, any of any of this, if I can get a, just a, a good and tight Star zoom on it. Sorry, uh, circle again. No, was it um, it, the, all of this right in it. the foreground. Right. Take your pick on wherever's easiest. You can uh, do laser zoom there if you want there. Tina, Asako, and Shore, is this is this just a hydroid overgrowing an old skeleton? Sorry, I had to peek at this guy while we're here. Yeah. Because <laughs> this looks like this looks like a hydroid to me, but I've never seen anything this big that was so uniformly covered if it is hydroid. And it doesn't look like any of the other kind of usual suspect corals around here. What are all those little circle-y bits? Are those Retracted polyps or eggs of some sort? Not a hundred percent sure what you're talking about. These little things. Oh, got it. Yeah. Oh. Um, not sure. Yeah, because there's white circles on some parts of it, but not all of it. Yeah. You can uh, push in a little tighter there if you want. They look kind of like eggs. Stop Cuz they don't look like your other polyps that are in. So Tina Tina's mm. voting either a Canthogorgia or a Paramaricea. All right, that's probably good enough for us to, I'm not sure we're gonna learn much more from looking at it. We'll have to study the still images. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. All right. How old are these squat lobsters? Are these crustaceans? I don't, I don't know. I don't think we know. Um. Cause so much of the deep sea critters live longer um, you know, the corals, thousands, hundreds of years old. Yep. And many of the fish uh, live to be many we can tens, go wild if not hundred years. Yeah. I mean, orange roughies live Thank to be you, over a hundred. Um, Greenland sharks live to be many hundreds of years old. 
but I don't think, I certainly don't know. Um, if On the crustaceans. Uh, about the crustaceans. To the question from Germany, the two green lasers are 10 centimeters apart. Four, four inches if you're from Texas. <laughs> I still have my Texas tape measure. It has fractions on it. <laughs> I guess we can uh, go for 20. Okay. That's what happened when we try to get greedy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Every time. Every time. Bridge nav. Can we move two zero meters, one zero zero, please? Thank you. looking at is a type of hydrozoan in the family Solandir uh, today. But that would be unquestionably the biggest hydrozoan I've ever seen. What are the apex predators down on the deep sea? Cephalopods? I mean, true apex predator are going to be like your six gill sharks. Uh. Uh. ROV question Is the ROV hardware imperial, metric, or a combination? Combination. Can't make it simple. That's fine. <laughs> uh, for the most part, uh, Hercules is imperial. But there's uh, components from all over the planet on the thing, so a lot of the sensors and such are uh, metric. Mm, question for Lynette. On your right hand side, there's a big red button. What does that do? <laughs> Press it and find out. Yeah, should we, <laughs> should we push it? <laughs> um, it's not actually a button, it's a light, um, and it's just indicating that the USBL transceiver is deployed in the down position in the moon pool. Um, so that's an instrument that we have to deploy before every dive and recover after every dive. Um, and that is an instrument that we use to track the positions of Atalanta and Hercules subsea. So that's just a reminder to us that it's in the down position, which <laughs> it should be during a dive. <laughs> Thank you. It very much should not be once we leave a dive. Yeah.
Uh, this has been such a great dive so far. You know, we've seen so many different corals and different um, types of life down here. This is like what, I don't know, the last time we down. came, I feel like a lot of the dives had this kind of level of density of mm -hmm. um, life. And Lula and I were kind of talking, we're saying that we we're kind of surprised. I mean, we have seen a lot of really cool things on our, on our watches, but it just wasn't what I am used to. So this is exactly kind of like- What you're used to? Yeah, like this very, very dense ecosystem. So it's nice to see that again. Ooh, do corals appear in sonar data? They, they can, um, but no. The sonars we're using really aren't going to see the individual, um, uh, the individual oh, corals. Certainly not from the ship. Um, and and yeah, depends on the sonar. But yeah, but it depends on the sonar. If you had a uh, a super high frequency forward looking multi beam or something, yeah, you can you could totally image them. That's Look another who one it up is. The wish list. Hello, good morning. <laughs> you don't want to put your headset on? Oh, let's look. You're about at to do an interaction. This, yeah. please. Right. Oh no, no mind. Wait. Oh. That's, oh, sorry. That's two different corals. I thought at that was a color shift in the middle of the coral. We can still look at it. But and we got time. We wait for the ship. But that is not what I thought it was initially. Oh, you were at 5:45. Uh, go ahead there. Well, you can do the 8:10. Uh, me. I'm doing the 8:10. So hi. All right. So we got a. And I'll up Sammy in the back. We've got a hemicorallium in the Ooh. front with some hydroids so overgrowing gorgeous. it. And then just off frame, we just were looking at a primnoid a second ago. And then... That is gorgeous. Sorry, you want to go up, down, left, right? Uh, just all over. Right. Kind of get a survey of the associates and what's living in this thing. We got a little apocopher in there, um, which, is, which is a coral predator. Which one is the coral predator? The little spiky the, one? No, it's a, you probably didn't notice it. It's a, the little tiny wormy thing. Um, Question for Lynette. Can you go swimming in the moon pool? <laughs> um, I what? don't think you would want to. <laughs> it's about maybe two feet diameter. 10 out of 10 would not recommend. So <laughs> seems super claustrophobic. Yeah, there wouldn't be much swimming. There'd be a lot of um, getting stuck. Drowning. Getting stuck and yeah. probably drowning, yeah. I asked the same question. <laughs> Even big moon, moon pools on other vessels are extremely violent because the heave of the vessel, all that volume of water is coming up and down. Oh, yeah. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah it know. would not be a good time. You could do the Marilyn Monroe if you're standing on top of it, for sure. So I think this is some type of munodopsid squat lobster. Um, Moving around so slowly. 
like a slow moving wave. Oh, oh now it's going. Two, oh. I think we're happy here. Roger. How okay. long do squat lobsters live? Ooh, no. that was what I, we just, oh really? Yeah. But like, how long uh, do, do we know how long like all crabs live? I think it depends on the species, like a blue crab will live like five years. Oh, that's not long at all. Why did I think it'd be longer? But in the deep sea? Ooh. So how often do y'all encounter species that you have never seen or heard of before? So at the species level, all the time. So you, the, the Latin I'm throwing around is generally family and genus level um, uh, identification. So I'm not even trying to get to f species level most of the time. Um, a few of the, the expert taxonomists we have in the chat helping us from shore who know these the taxonomy of these organisms much better we'll get into the species level sometimes but it's I mean and if we start looking at things like individual species of apocophrins and and squat lobsters and stuff like that we're seeing numerous undescribed species on this dive alone um, so many of them have been seen before but no one has t taken the time and the effort to actually formally describe them and name them um, but I'm sure we're seeing um, organisms that are new to science as well, even if it's just the little tiny things we're kind of zooming in, like the amphipods, and and not spending a lot of time on. But I am quite confident at some point there in this expedition we're seeing um, some type of new species um, that have never been filmed before, and we're just not even aware of it, frankly. What is all that family genus phylum business you talk about all the time? <laughs> yeah, How's so that order go. Um, I have my family, my wife, <laughs> my <laughs> um, Yeah, so there's the, the we generally call the Linnaean hierarchy taxonomy. Um, starts at kingdom or domain, kingdom, phylum, and then I actually have to look up which is the order sometimes. Um, Did King Henry drink grape soda? No. S something like that, yes. There is Did a Did King Henry drink grape soda? Yes. Domain, domain kingdom. kingdom. Phyla. Oh no, did King Philip. 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 Did King Philip drink what is D order? Did King Philip order grape soda? I feel soda? like they've changed it since I learned it a hundred years ago. <laughs> Must be a ditty like for resistor color codes. Did King Philip of France kill Queen Joan? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh wait. <laughs> no, this is just that's uh, history. Oh, okay, that's okay. history of uh -huh. Europe. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, it's um, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, is but what's the mnemonic? I don't know. Um, so are there out of that? Are there like the one I three remember, basic I remember ones? The, that we the, the, I mine my, my mnemonic starts at kingdom, but it's King Philip came over for ginger snaps. Was the way I learned it. Did King Philip come over for ginger snaps? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Did King Philip come over for grape soda then? That would work too. Yep. Um, but also, there's a whole bunch of now super order and subphylums and sub this and super that and subspecies so it it is far far more complicated than that if you actually start looking in the uh, we we use a reference called the world order of marine species or worms um, for another kind of the, um, <laughs> the central Love repository it. for where we keep track of these things and if you pull up the actual worms taxonomy it has many more steps in that than just kingdom phylum class order family genus species um, so this is a nested approach. Basically, you can think of it as a branching tree with 
kingdom being uh, uh, the trunk of the tree and then each branch um, branching out into smaller and smaller levels until you get to a species being a single leaf um, out on the tree is how you can visualize the way this approach works. Um, but allows us to kind of think about um, evolutionary histories and who's more related to other um, species. So the, when you're calling them, Brian, you're in the... I'm in the family and genus space most of the time. So that's, you know, two and three levels up from the finest level. And then, and then if I start getting into brittle stars and stuff like that, a lot of times I'm in the family and order range. Oh, I like this mnemonic. Do kings play chess on funny green squares? So we've got a couple big hemicralliums, a couple of slamias. <laughs> um, I like that there's one a too. Tina four. Yeah. yeah. Those of you who were asking about Tina fours earlier. Um, got some type of black coral there. The sponge. Yep. Looks like one sponge. A big basket star. Come down another five for me. Can't quite get around there. Oh, I can, but I have to pull on it. It's funny, I think the more sci formal science training I have, the less I remember kind of the basic things like the order of the the taxonomies, like those kind of factoids, uh, leave yeah. my brain as some more obscure theory stuff replaced it. <laughs> we joke about PhD standing for permanent head damage, and I truly think it's, I think it's true to some extent. My wife and I were joking. My wife also has a PhD, and when I was going to grad school, started going to grad school to get mine, we were worried about being able to like cook ourselves dinner by the time we both had PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> Every ingredient in a pickle jar but can't remember how to open it. Exactly. <laughs> Ooh. Another beautiful basket star on this hemicorallium. And it looks like we've got a um, Bulopathies um, black coral in right the bottom left it. with a squat lobster sitting on it. Are squat lobsters some of the most widely distributed families? Because they're everywhere from hydrothermal vents, sure. shallow deep seas. I don't actually know. They are quite common, you're right. They are in a lot, a lot of ways, but there's, I believe, a squat lobster. Well, squat lobster is not exactly a, a, a formal specific term. name. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, certainly crustaceans are extremely widely um, um, distributed in the in marine. They're pretty much found everywhere um, except the deepest parts of the ocean. And now I say that I can't remember if an amphipod is actually where amphipods live in there, and they're found all the way down. size of these these corralliums is just amazing. Got another another type of black coral kind of lower in the frame on this um, this rock. I think it's that that color you were complaining about earlier. You didn't want to paint your house black coral red. No, no, that looks like a dead tree. No. But the hemicorallium. You just made black coral sad. Uh, I'm sorry, black coral. I kind of like it. It's the like brown? Rusty. Rusty colored. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I want people to think of when they walk in my house. Mm. Rust. Rust. <laughs> Tons no, of rust. It's patina. I mean, that's yeah. like the 1970s motif color right there. <laughs> it's coming back, mid-century modern. I do like the 1970s UC 
of yellows and oranges. But I will take the pinks, the yellows, and then the Victor Gorgia colors. Oh, I love the Victor Gorgia color. The lilac of the sea. Oh. I put down a piece of plywood and let my dogs walk on it while they were muddy and took that to the paint store. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. <laughs> I don't think I've washed the house since. Is this another slow moving 360? I'm just trying to sneak around and see the other side. Yeah, so this looks Whoa. like two different individual colonies. Um, this is so cool. It looks like a giant mitt trying to catch something. Yeah. Trying to catch food out of the water. Teamwork makes the dream work. And it looks like a lot of the right hand colony is being overgrown by hydroids. And the hydroids are the yellow ones. Yep. Yep. So the pink is the uh, original coral, and uh, the yellow is. Can go white on hydroids. Can't see anything but light there. Does the scoop of the corals usually face into the prevailing current? I don't know off the top of my head. That's something we should look for. So and that's gorgeous. gonna change based on taxa. Like if we look at the, the Chrysogorgias, they all, the, the, the tall ones, like the Eritogorgia and the Metallogorgia, they all face down current. Um, and the Enov Samias keep their polyps down current. Um, and I don't, I'd have, to sit, I'd have to look at which way the current's flowing on these. I don't know, if, remember off my top of my head, which way the hemichoralliums orient. Brian, I was going to ask you, does it about the polyp direction? Because it seems like on this, the polyp direction is on the other side, so the outer curve of it? Yeah. Okay. That wouldn't surprise me at all if, if the... Um, oh. Oh, there goes the squat lobster, we scared. Squatty. Oh. Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all it if like the it's curve is towards the water, the flow, matrix. and the polyps are on the back side. Yeah. It looks like it's running on water. Would you say that the hydroids are parasitic? Like, do they require, like, taking over someone else's skeleton? That's where we see them most often, yes, is that they colonize dead coral skeleton. Um, but I've, some types of hydroids can grow their own skeleton. So the, the one we collected yesterday, two days ago, that had the egg cases on it, I think was natively a, its own hydroid skeleton. Okay. But here, this is definitely overgrowing um, the branches of, of this hemichoralium. Now the real question is, is it fighting the hemichoralium and killing it back? Or is it just invading branches that are already um, tied back? And I don't know in this case. Okay. Really nice beauty shot here. Yeah. Couple different basket stars. I think from the science point of view, I think we're good. I do. I do and Daryl, if you see particular shots that you want to work on, beauty shots, let us know, and we can certainly do that too. All right. Thanks. Question online. How disturbing are the lights of the ROVs to the animals that have never seen light before? It's very, very taxa specific. Um, and it can range from not at all to some. Um, you'll see, if we, when we see the snapper branchid eels, a lot of times they open their mouths and shake their heads. Uh, and that seems to be an expression of annoyance. Um, but a lot of the other organisms, I'd they, while they can see, they're sensitive to different wavelengths and stuff like that, or they can't see at all. So um, generally, I am under the belief that anything that's really bothered by the lights is probably already gone by the time we get there. So the big squids and big sharks and stuff that mm -hmm. definitely have the ability to see, um, they're just going to get out of the way. Uh, and the inverts don't seem to react like the squat lobsters and stuff very much. Uh, and then, like I said, the snapper branchid eels and some of the other fish show some mild annoyance. But when you think about it, you live in a world that's totally black and you see 200,000 lumens of light coming at you. 
if it bothers you, you got plenty of time to get out of the way. Makes sense. And Keep going, Dan. And these vehicles yeah. are also very loud, yeah. too, so. But can I get our ducks in a row here? We might have to do a spin. I think we're all right, are we? Hmm? What'd you say? Oh, I was trying to work out if we had to take a tether turn out, but I think we're good. Yeah, you can keep moving. So yesterday we were talking about uh, the book that was written by Edie, gosh, I'm blanking out on her last name, but discussing how ROVs... Edie Witter. Witter, thank you. Discussing how ROVs are loud and they're noisy and it's so disturbing for the deep sea communities. Do you think, uh, are there any ways that we could change how we explore the deep sea to accommodate for bioluminescence, biofluorescence, being quieter? Sure, all the different things. I mean, you know, there's some really impressive technology out there and low light cameras and stuff that some of that's being deployed in the deep sea. You know, one, there are certain, there are cameras that are so sensitive they can detect individual photon pairs and stuff like that now. Um, as well that. And then, yep, and then Huey, has, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute has the Mesobot, which is a much quieter, much um, lower kind of impact vehicle that's designed to float uh, in the mesophotic and is super light sensitive and much quieter and gentler and designed to look at um, individual like tenophores and stuff like that autonomously um, and, and follow them through the midwater. So there's definitely work on those kind of things. Um, but <coughs> but yeah, you can get into propeller design and you know electric vehicles are a little bit quieter than hydraulic vehicles and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different um, ways to make these vehicles quieter. But the corals don't really seem to care. This is a nice big black coral next to another hemichorallium. It's a big black coral. Yeah, it is. It's probably a bathopathies. That is a thick, 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 thick hemichoralia. I've been really interested um, in some, I've seen some things recently about new propeller designs um, that are substantially quieter for drones um, that might also work underwater. I'm going to mispronounce it, but it's a tortoroidal, I think, propeller design. It looks yeah. completely different. Um, but it's way, way quieter for like drone sized engines. All oh, the rage in the 3D printing community yep. now. Yeah. Oh. Another umbilopathies there, a black coral that looks. It's a great sin sign or a great example of kind of convergent evolution where you've got a umbilopathies, an umbilula, and a metallogorgia that have all kind of converged on this stalk with umbrella shape top, um, but come from very, very different uh, evolutionary backgrounds. We can uh, keep her moving if you want. This, this is just an epic um, area, cor coral area. And we are getting very close to the, the top of this knoll or nubbin or whatever we want to call it. Um, and then we'll start down the back side of it here. And hopefully have time to get down it and climb the next one in the series is before we have to recover this afternoon. <coughs> Here's another primnoid, big primnoid, this grayer color one. Here. It's the same cliptrophor that we've been seeing. Yeah, pull it. 
come down if I have this on them. Get my shot here. Yeah. Look at that, the, the Primnoid appears to have landed on the base of the Corallium, or, the, or they may just be growing together, I'm not sure. But they can't tell the base from one coral to the other. When you think about all the bare rock we see around here, the fact that they end up growing that close to each other is pretty interesting to me. So do you think AUVs will allow us to understand more of the ocean faster? Oh, yeah. Yes. Unquestionably. <laughs> On, you know, the, the reduction in size, the reduction in cost, and the improvements in autonomy are really going to increase the pace of ocean ex exploration at an exponential rate. And yeah, they are. And AUVs can stay out for a lot longer. They don't have families to go back to. Yeah, but they can't hover. Or lateral. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're each, each tool for each job, certainly. But if you think about how much more efficient we would be if we just had an AUV to drop out here, go, you know, photogrammetry the whole feature and tell us exactly where all the corals are, and then we can come back with the ROV and land straight in a coral garden every time would be so much more efficient than all the time we spend trying to find the corals to then document them and sample them. The uh, ROV, AUV field is just booming as well. Yeah. They're getting the smarter hybrid. vehicles, yeah, yep. hybrid vehicles. And then you start thinking about edge computing and things like that and having one operator operating multiple vehicles that just kind of flash a light when it says it needs a human's inner um, input. Yeah, and they all know each other's position. Talk to each other. Swarm. Swarm of, our, swarm of AUVs. So here's a whole little cluster of stocked crinoids all of a sudden. Yeah, the technology aspects of, of deep sea exploration science is really changing the game very quickly. And we're really on the cusp of I generally call it an inflection point where we're going from a kind of a linear growth curve. If you want to explore motion, you need, you know, additional ships and ROVs, and it, each one can only explore X number, and it's just kind of a linear. For every extra ship and vehicle you add, you get that same a bit more. Um, and I think we're about to kind of cross an inflection point where it's going to become an exponential growth curve when we start thinking about one ship being able to deploy five vehicles simultaneously doing different things. And, Stuff like that's going to go a long way. You compare ROVs to the uh, automotive industry, we're still using a crank to start the thing. Yeah. Or the aviation industry, we're still in the definitely in the propeller phase. Huh. If you uh, if you're in a if you're out ahead, can we sample one of these um, primnoids? Sure. So either that one or that one. Can do. Find a landing spot here. Like, uh, perch on the ledge here, maybe. been seeing these primnoids enough that they're definitely a, an important um, member of this community, so I want to confirm the ID. And we got some weirdness going on with sea stars here. Oh. I feel like we're entering like a private moment for them. It is possible.
current. Let's try to perch gently on the ledge here. Gonna put this sample in the box, or yeah, we got the small or the large bio boxes are the only open ones, or the slurp jars, one through four and six. We could maybe try a snip and slurp here. Yeah, we can. We can, do a, no, we can do a snip and slurp. We'll have to do a little housekeeping here. To You want to, uh, while I'm playing around with toys here, you want to zoom in? Some here are the amphipods. So many of them. Yeah, these little red dots you're seeing in here around the corals are, are amphipods. And I've remarked on the last couple of dives that we haven't seen uh, a lot of them on, um, on the corals we have seen which was surprising to me. Can you put the hit uh, three on the bubble cam? Copy that. So here's another, this is a good example of why we call the, why we call deep sea corals um, ecosystem engineers of all the different life that lives in them. So they create habitat, they land on bare rock uh, and grow and then create habitat for numerous other um, taxa. So we've got hydroids here, we've got brittle stars, we've got crinoids, we've got amphipods, we've got squat lobsters, all calling this coral home. Daryl, can we zoom on Atlanta? Does science have a preference on which jar we use? We don't have a preference on which one other than not seven and not five. Copy, I'm going for six. Oh, it's gonna kill Lila, they're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> seven, six, five. Ooh. Isn't that in a song? <gasps> Oh, it's that song where they say the phone number. Wait, yeah, wait six, know, uh, seven, five, three, oh, nine. Oh, God, that's going to be stuck in my head now. I used to give that phone Jane. number out to people and people would ask me for my phone number. <laughs> Any particular uh, branch there? Nope. Just 10 to 15 centimeters of total branches. Don't care which one. Uh. Very exciting. How about these guys here? Yep, that should be fine. Looks good. Okay, I can uh, go away for us there. You're gonna have to uh, manage to get that bubble cam down on the end of the slurp there. Copy that. 
Is that good there, Dan? Yeah, can we zoom in a bit on that? Copy that. I'm ready for T4 when you are. Plastic manipulator operator. There. Copy that. C4 is 100%. Nope. Nice catch. I'll have to come off the rock. Daryl, could we go wider on the Atlanta? Thanks. Can you uh, porch out a little? Copy that. Nope. <laughs> Was that too much? Oh, well, it's pulling the slurp back out of the... I could try that. Zoom in a bit for us, I don't know. And we've got open bio boxes too. So yeah, this is not uh, help me. Starboard box is the only uh, option there, is it? Yeah, the two large, the two large boxes in starboard. All right. Do you want T four to zero? Oh yeah, please. Copy that. Let's zoom in on something there, there while we're playing with our box. You could zoom in on that Atlanta. <laughs> Ready for the box, Dan? No, not quite. Okay. Serious deja I feel like I've been right here before. Okay. Any large box? That's good. And, uh, we're running out of file boxes. Mm. Just hide this okay. Close it. Copy that. 
So we're just coming up on shift change. You'll see a, yeah, hear a lot of background noise. Back off, huh? Two, when you get a chance. Copy. Oh, okay, the two. As, uh, all the different uh, teams hand over to each other. And go wait for us we'll move on to continuing to explore. What's up? Good, how are you doing? Find something to look out for. Watch change. It's real. Uh, can you port chain? It's a needs our magnet thing. Oh, there are tape go, but hold it. It stays in there. It just doesn't like click so in. So Brian all the way. and Adam are discussing the biodiversity they've seen on the different uh, sea mounts as we the little bumps we've gone up on this dive track and. Uh, each watch lead hands over to uh, the next what they've sort of seen line, in their uh, watch to look out for and what we're continuing out. to look for on the next four hours. So we have a complete changeover in this room. Pilots, nav, watch leads, loggers. Okay, guys, I'm turning over to Annie. Did we already look at these? Video change. This vast assortment here? Yeah, I think they've gotten lots of close-ups on okay. uh, this whole this whole coral garden. Roger. So we're done here? We are done here. Chris, did they do an eDNA? Sample somewhere around here. Okay. We're gonna scoot over into position here. Okay.
Mm. Should we put it at her station? Okay. Eight to twelve signing in. Judging by what I see here, we're gonna set a new record for the <laughs> least Ooh. amount of ground covered. <laughs> no way. <laughs> what? No, <laughs> no. This this watch Fighting is words. turning over a new leaf. We're yes. not gonna stop yes, at everything. I believe that. We're cover some ground. Well, stop at most things. Blow by. <laughs> I know. What if you miss something? No, Don't no. you have a fear of you know, FOMO? No, no, we got... <laughs> fear we, of missing do, out. <laughs> this is like uh, dad style where you're identifying stuff while you're driving by, <laughs> not <laughs> really stopping. What Can't about, stop, we're making good time. <laughs> <laughs> what about FOMOSK? Fear of missing out on sponges and corals. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. So, shall we go? Let's go. Let's go. Let's so go. I think what one of the things we're interested in they've they've seen a uh, high density and biodiversity for the last I don't know hundred meters of elevation. We're interested to see if we see that on the other side in the same depth range. Great. Let's get there. Bridge, Nav. Good morning. Uh, let's do uh, three zero meters, one one zero. We also, uh, just as an update, don't have a lot of sampling capacity left. Mm. Um, I think one bio wow. box. That is a very large hemicorallium. We also have not gotten a rock for a while. <laughs> so we have one, uh, kind of we need to grab another rock at some point. Oh. oh, oh, the squat lobster wants a hug. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, 8 to 12. How's everybody feeling? Woo! Woo! Woo Come on now. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. Okay, we have new viewers turning, uh, tuning in. Uh, when we're ready, can we start with introductions and a follow up question? Um, I asked this before, I think. Uh, so, if you were to be one mythological creature, what would you be? Whoa. What would you choose to be? Mm. Let's go. All right, so I'm Adam Sewell. I'm a professor at University of Rhode Island, director of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Uh, I study submarine volcanoes. Um, Let's see, uh, I've been on Nautilus uh, a few times before, lots of other uh, vessels and, via and ships as well. Uh, mythological creature? Jeez. <laughs> I don't, this is just going to be like a... Anyway. I haven't had like a, a this thought before, so I, it's not like I have a plan on this one. But maybe that uh, that like brass owl from <laughs> Clash of the Titans. What? 
That's very well, specific. I started off thinking, well, maybe I'd be the Kraken, because, God, I love release Kraken. the Kraken. Oh, yeah, yeah. But then I thought, well, then you're kind of in, you're stuck in the water all the time, so I would be the Brass Owl. I don't even know if that's a real one. <laughs> I like that one. That yeah. is, yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Jules. Um, I am a scientist on the Nautilus. I work at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, I have a background in coral biology, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a mermaid again. Oh, I feel like that's a pretty solid one. Yep, it is. Oh, hi everyone. My name is Paola Santiago. I am today's this watch data logger, and I am a marine biologist from Puerto Rico. And as for magical creatures go, I don't know much. I've been Googling this entire time to see if I can find something. <laughs> but um, she's going to be a garden gnome? Is that what she said on that? <laughs> I might have to side with Jules on this one and say Mayor Mermaid. <laughs> and it's your birthday. Yeah, and it's happy your birthday. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> It's great. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's go. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Annie Halleck. I'm this watches a CF. Um, I'm from Pao Pao American Samoa. I'm a lo local educator back home teaching marine science and biology. Um, my first time sailing with the Nautilus, so this is exciting for me. Um, mythical creatures. Wow. Um, I would have to say either, you know what, yeah, I'm going to have to say the Megalodon. Well, that's not, not mythical. That's not mythical, but yeah, okay, let's go with the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The Loch Ness, yeah. I have to, that's right. Yeah. Loch Ness Monster. All right, hey, Dave. Row. Hey, Dave Robertson, uh, lead video engineer and uh, sitting in the video chair here, trying to make things look good. Um, uh, mythical creature, mythical, uh, <laughs> I have no idea on this, I'm with Adam, no pre-plan. Um, uh, let's go uh, Greek mythology and go Hercules. Oh. Oh, a human creature. Well, Herc. semi-mythical. <laughs> Let's go. TJ. God, there's so much diversity here. I know, this is really crazy. I, I can't hear you. Sorry, TJ, on SPL. He is. There we are. Oh, really? Oh, uh, oh there we go. Oh, no, sorry. SPL there, no. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. TJ Scanlon here, uh, Atlanta pilot. Uh, mythical creatures. Kind of caught in the hop there. Um, like a jackalope? Uh, caught in the hop? <laughs> caught in the hop. <laughs> um, I'd go for, I don't know, is the senator the, are they? The centaur? Uh, oh, the centaur. centaur. Uh, half bull, half. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think I wasn't sure, I wasn't 100% on the name. No, does, uh, I forget. Minotaur. There's a horse and man. Minotaur. 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 Yeah. That's it. Either one. Either one. There you go. One of them. I think a minotaur is a bull with yeah, a human, and a centaur, is a, centaur. centaur. centaur is a horse. The horse, there it is. Oh, oh yeah, those are cool. Nice. Either one. Either one. Either one. Okay, Robert, what do you got? Uh, Robert Waters, I'm the Herc pilot. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, a unicorn. <laughs> Everybody loves unicorns. <laughs> Good choice. Noted. <laughs> you get to nickname. fly around. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Unicorns don't fly. Oh, well, Zeus, flying unicorn. They, they, flying they, unicorn. They do now. What was Zeus's house? Uh, oh, yeah, like that's a Pegasus. 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 So Pegasus. A Pegasus. Pegasus. Yeah, that's Pegasus. it. Okay. So you don't, get those a, guys? you don't get a unicorn horn then. Oh. Well, that's so better. We I don't can, know. We can strap like on a horn. Seems like you get in the way anyway. Yeah, a centaur Pegasus. with a prosthetic horn. <laughs> I like, I like the Pegasus. That's the, that's what I'm going with. Do we want to keep moving, uh, science? Y yes. Okay. Bridge nav. Pella, are you getting all these? 
Let's do uh, <laughs> three so Emmy Corralium, three zero Victor meters, Gorgia, one zero zero. Norella. Uh, what are those yellow ones again? Plexorid. That's Plexorid. Crying and right heading. What are we doing? One zero zero. We're gonna be going downhill. Yeah, we're well. We've got about sixty meters till the top of oh, this I little see. hole, I and see. then we'll be going downhill. Oh, sure looks like downhill. Over well, there. maybe from back there. <laughs> 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 no, it does look like we're flattening it out here, so it could be we could be starting to slope downwards. But we're not technically to the top of the knoll yet. But of course, this is not as precise as our. Uh, Samantha, we yes. didn't hear your intro. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, Samantha Wishnack, navigator, um, also the operations coordinator for the Ocean Exploration Trust, which owns and operates Nautilus. I think I'm going to have to go with Chimera. I feel like I'm a hybrid of many things. I can blend in easily places. Uh, <laughs> not, not to be confused with the Chimera of the seafloor, which are also amazing. <laughs> what is, What goes into a Chimera? I think it's usually like a lion and an eagle, but oh. no, wait, but you know they have like different parts from all the different animals. Oh yeah. right, right. These are really. Are, am I thinking about griffins? Corals. Griffin, yeah. Griffin. Griffin. I was thinking griffin. That Is that a flying lion? <laughs> flying lion? Flying lion. That's <laughs> <laughs> when I was a <laughs> semi-pro wrestler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the flying lion. Okay. <laughs> We are here. We are moving. A lot of basket stars associates here. I feel like I woke up in a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Green Looks eggs like and ham? Yeah. Okay, exactly. that's right. Yeah. Oh, the places you will go? <laughs> <laughs> I actually know Dr. Seuss's birthday That's because my son shares that same birthday. Oh, well, isn't that neat? Yeah. I had a roommate that was his uh, pool guy. <laughs> <laughs> he used to get Dr. <laughs> Seuss books all the time. <laughs> yeah. Signed ones. Yeah. Cool. Huh. Yeah, he lives in La Jolla. All right, anyone know Dr. Seuss's real name? Nope, not mm. me. Nope. Theodore Geisel. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, <coughs> try and kick sideways a little. I'm not sure I can reach that guy. Should be able to. Uh, go ahead, there. Sit in there. Yeah. So, although I think so. Did someone say that the rock that they collected before was also brown or something? So I don't know if somewhere on this, if it's just the seamount has a bunch of oxidi random oxidized rocks or something. Out of all the rocks we have collected so far this expedition, 